Good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Africa Studies 8th Annual Senghor Dhamma Sessa Lecture. This lecture, named for the three African and African diaspora writers and nationalists who championed the negritude movement, brings to our campus noted scholars from all over the world and artists as well. And these scholars, writers, speakers are invited to address issues pertaining to the black diaspora in all these ramifications. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this for their support and generous contributions. Uh, and this will be the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies and the Cultural Studies Program. This year, today, this evening, it is our honor to have as our lecturer Molefi Kete Asante, Professor of African American Studies at Temple University. If there's a single individual who has been the most instrumental in the systematic ordering of the apparatus of scholarship in the field of black studies, it must be Professor Asante. His influence is far reaching with a prolificity of intellectual production that has generated over 70 books and hundreds of scholarly articles that have been published in all kinds, all kinds of scholarly uh, journals and magazines. Professor Asante is absolutely, in our own estimation, the critical voice in the articulation of the entire discipline of African studies, or African studies. However, even with such prodigious intellectual output, Professor Asante's signal contribution to world knowledge is his position as a preeminent and founding theorist of Afrocentricism, a movement, a thought, that insists on the study of Africa and African peoples through an African-informed paradigm. So much of the discussions of Africa and the black diaspora in the past 30, 40 years has been framed by Afrocentricism. It's also to his credit that in 1987, Professor Asante created the first PhD program in African-American studies here at Temple University in Philadelphia. And from there, he has directed over 140 dissertations, written so many articles uh, on the field of Af Afrocentricism. Asante was born in southern Georgia, and as he puts it in, in the preface to his 2007 book, The History of Africa, The Quest for Eternal Harmony, he says that he is the great, great, you know, he's, the, you know, he's born to the great, great, great grandson of enslaved Africans. And by DNA testing, you know, he knows that he's of Nubian and Yoruba ancestry. From Nigeria. From Nigeria. So he is. So, so he, I'm right here, I'm introducing my kinsman, a fellow Nigerian. Uh, <laughs> all right. And so, um, and not only that, but in, in terms of his academic uh, journey, he got his bachelor's in communication from Oklahoma Christian College. Um, his master's also in communication from Pepperdine and his PhD from UCLA in communication as well with cognate specialization in history. And you may be impressed to know that Professor Sante got his PhD at the early age of 26. And since then, he has published, like I said earlier, on over 70 books. Uh, and these books include Afrocentric Manifesto, published in 2008, uh, As I Run Toward Africa in 2011, Molana Karenga, An Intellectual Portrait, published in 2009, um, Encyclopedia of Black Studies, a very critical, very, very seminal work in itself. Uh, Encyclopedia of Black Studies in 2004, Encyclopedia of African Religion uh, in 2008, and then both well, these were both uh, created with Ama uh, and But And there are so many, you know, we can list 70 books here. But the incredible thing about Professor Center that he has indeed addressed just about every facet of black experience, black studies, black intellectual, you know, uh, production. And in addition to that, Professor Asente is also the founding editor of the Journal of Black Studies. 
He was the president of the Civil Rights Organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee chapter at, USC, at UCLA. And in 1995, he was made, Professor Asante was made a traditional king uh, named Nana Okru Asante Piesa, the Kyodomene of Tafo Akien in Ghana. So we're not only seeing, you know, a very astute uh, academic, but he is in, any, in every way a traditional and true African to the core. Uh, but not only that too, Professor Asante in 2003 was appointed to the African Union's steering committee for the Conference of Intellectuals of Africa and its <coughs> diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most privileged moments that I have to invite you to join me in welcoming in our midst, Professor Molefi Asante. Thank you very much, Professor Okoma, and I just want to uh, say thank you very much to uh, uh, Professor Lucky and the Africana Studies Program. Uh, it's really great to be here at Villanova. I, I think, as I consider, you know, being in Philadelphia for 28 years, this is my first time speaking at Villanova, I think, but I'm just happy to be here and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Really great to see uh, Professor Hezekiah uh, Lewis, uh, who of course attended the University of California, just like I did. <laughs> and he was a student with my son, not with me. So I'm just really delighted to, to see him. And also uh, other uh, professors and uh, colleagues uh, uh, from engineering and from uh, history and, and other fields. I'm really delighted that you have come out here today. Um, here's what I want to do. I want to talk a bit about uh, negritude. I want to say something about uh, Afrocentricity and something about the United States of, Amer of, of Africa. But let me just preface my remarks by saying that I was fortunate as a student at UCLA uh, to have had dinner with Leopold Singor, one of the founders of the Negritude Movement. And this was uh, long before I was conscious of who he was, <laughs> what he was about. You know how you, you, you're just a student. I was a student. I was a student leader. And the university looked around for uh, the black person who could sit down with a black president. You know? And I had been a student leader, so they invited me from the Golden Bruin organization to sit down with the chancellor and with uh, uh, President Leopold Singor. It was only later that I learned more about who Singor was. So I was happy to get a chance to meet him. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Then I also had the opportunity in 1987 to uh, meet Ame Césaire. Uh, and this was uh, at, uh, in Miami. So he had never been to the US. He had refused to come to the US. He lived in Martinique. I'm going to pay homage to him in December. He, he lived in um, Martinique, but he refused to come to America. Uh, there, there, it had a lot to do with his understanding of the United States and segregation and racism, and he just did not. So fortunately, Carlos Moore was influential in getting him to just come for two days to a conference in Miami on negritude as Isaiah relented and came. Leon Damas, these are, I'll go over these names again with you if you don't know. Leon Damas, uh, in his last days, taught at Howard University. And uh, I never got a chance to meet him, but after his death, uh, I was able to uh, meet his wife. His wife was from, uh, was actually a Brazilian. Uh, he himself, uh, Damas, uh, was from uh, what you might call at the time, a French Guiana. Uh, and of course, Senghor was from Senegal and uh, Césaire from Martinique. 
And there, there were other people like Paulette uh, Nardell. Sometimes we don't mention her in the Negritude movement, but Paulette Nardell and her sister, Jane Nardell, were also uh, 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 coming out of the Caribbean basin. Uh, they were very influential in Paris in helping to create the Negritude movement uh, because they introduced Senghor and Césaire to the Harlem Renaissance people. That was their connection. And then there was also from Malagasy, uh, Jacques Robin Menanjara. So what you have in the development, and I think there are two movements, I just as a preface here, there are two general movements, in my judgment, in the African uh, world that were ideological uh, in their attempts to theorize the situation of African people in the continent of Africa and in the diaspora. One movement was the Negritude movement. The other movement is the Afrocentric movement. Those are two prime movements. Now, some people say that they are variants of the Pan-African movement. But it seems to me that uh, sometimes uh, Pan-Africanism is ambiguous. So uh, even though it is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and people talk about Pan-Africanism, but what it is, is very difficult to put a, put a handle onto. So consequently, theoretically and philosophically, when people talk about the African world, uh, what normally we talk about in a theoretical sense now, in terms of theoretical ideas, we talk a lot about Afrocentricity and negritude. But of course, they were not uh, the only movements. They are just the ones that we are most familiar with. Uh, in Brazil, for example, there was Quilombismo. The Quilombismo movement uh, uh, was uh, uh, actually took its lead from Abdias do Nascimento, the most famous uh, Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian Afro leader uh, and thinker and artist and creator. Uh, but uh, Quilombismo, because of Portuguese probably, never gained the significance of negritude or Afrocentricity. As, as a theoretical movement. And it was a theoretical movement based fundamentally on what uh, Nascimento used to call uh, the uh, quilombos that came out of the uh, resistance to Portuguese uh, enslavement uh, where uh, they created the first real republic in the Americas. This was the Palmares Republic that was created by the Africans in, in Brazil. This was even before Haiti. Uh, created its own independent republic. So, so, so there's a, a big movement around these uh, ideas. These were uh, ideas, uh, first of all, in terms of negritude that came with the students. These were, and all these movements are really student movements when you think about it, because the idea behind the negritude movement was that you had all these black students studying in Paris in the 1920s and the 1930s. And what they were being bombarded with in the schools and particularly at the top universities and the top, the Sorbonne, what they were being bombarded with was French culture, French culture, French culture, French culture. And they saw the negation of Africa every day. They were just being beaten down, beaten down. French culture is this, French culture is that, French culture is beautiful, French duck, uh, so, so it was almost as if Africa had no culture. So these students, you, I, I can mention this to you, but you probably don't, have never seen one. These students had a mimeograph machine. <laughs> uh-huh. Dr. Lucky knows about it. You see what I mean? You can see. But y'all know nothing about mimeograph machine. This is a whole different age, right? Um, really, you, you may know. How many of y'all, raise your hand, how many people know about the mimeograph? <laughs> it's very telling. This is really, this is really amazing. The, the mimeograph machine was a machine that you would, you would type on. You would type on a carbon and then you would put the carbon on a cylinder, and then you would run papers off. That's how you got your copies. You would run them off, with, with, and your hands would get all inky and, you know, and so on. But, that, that's, but what the students did in Paris, that's what they did. They created a journal, and they began to publish 
uh, uh, poems, uh, uh, literary pieces, and they call this, they, they call this movement negritude, which in English, most people translate it as blackness. They said, this, this, we want to express ourselves. We want to be ourselves. Cesaire said, for example, in 1987, when he was reflecting on this, he said that negritude was a revolt. He said, we, 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 we were looking for a revolt. We were looking for sanity. We were looking for some way to save ourselves. So we revolted against this absolute persistent push of French culture. And they said, we were crazy. In fact, what some of the French writers wrote about the negritude movement was that it was surrealism. That really they were just, these African writers were just really playing. They were just trying to put things uh, at odds with each other, but they were not really serious. But Cesaire argued that when I say that my worst day is a white day, I'm not being surreal, I'm telling the truth. I'm talking factually. So this was, this was really uh, a new use of language that had entered the vocabulary, the lexicon of French thinking and writing. And people were, were amazed at, wow, what is all this about? And he says in the end that the revolt is not an end in, of, in, in itself. The revolt also leads us somewhere. It is not a dead end. It's not just reaction for the sake of reaction. And this is what's beautiful. It leads us as African students in Paris back to ourselves. That is the key. That is fundamental. We go back to ourselves. Now, a few years later, of course, in the United States, we had in the 1960s, large numbers of African Americans going to major universities for the first time. There had been African Americans at major universities uh, before, but not in such numbers as in the 1960s. And in the 1960s, these African American students found themselves almost in a similar position as the blacks in the French universities in the 1920s and 30s. It's like, what is the relevance of us learning about dead white heroes and dead white philosophers? And we don't even know our own philosophers. Which was a big question. And so the, the reaction to that was black studies. This is where we came up with black. We said, wait a minute. There, there has to be another way. There, 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 there are other things in the world other than just simply looking at Western civilization. There are other people who have thought. I mean, the philosophers of ancient Africa like Dwarf and Amenemope and Patahotep and Imhotep and Akhenaten and Kununu, these philosophers, they existed before Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. Why don't we study them? They were raising serious questions about the fundamental basis of education in America. So out of that experience evolved black studies, Africana studies, African American studies. Let us begin to examine from a standpoint of African agency the new realities. We can examine everything from that. Architecture, engineering, <laughs> drama, health, social work. And so out of that, we, we used to call it the black perspective. I was the first director, permanent director of the UCLA Center for African American Studies. And at that time, we wrote a document called Education from a Black Perspective. Because we, were, we, didn't, we, didn't, have a, we didn't have Afrocentricity as a, we, as a con concept at that time. So we just said from a black perspective. Let, let us examine communication from a black perspective. Let us examine psychology from a black perspective. What answers do we get? Are they different answers? These were the serious questions. So Afrocentricity was about the establishment of agency on the part of African people when it came to information and knowledge. 
Now, here's how this re all relates to the United States of Africa. Over the last 15 years, I've been engaged with uh, the question of African unity. But, of course, this is a long-term discussion that has been going on for uh, much longer than me. Uh, and when you look back at uh, the 1948 statement by Sheikh Anta Jop, uh, Sheikh Anta Jop, uh, the uh, preeminent, in my judgment, the preeminent African scholar of the 20th century, uh, wrote in Présence Africaine, one of the outstanding international journals out of Africa. He wrote a, he wrote a question about African Renaissance, and he wanted to know when and how shall we speak of the African Renaissance. And he, his whole uh, premise was that you cannot speak about an African Renaissance unless you first understand uh, where Africa has come from in terms of its current uh, uh, construction, but also have some basis for cultural unity of Africa. And so his, these two things, wh what had happened to Africa? I mean, when you look at Africa today, you can say, wow, there are 55 countries that are identified on the map of Africa. But those 55 nations that, that are identified uh, have been created for the most part by colonial interests. Europeans created those 55 countries. Take Nigeria, for example. It didn't, it, Africans didn't create that. This is created by Europe. Kenya, created by Europe. Zimbabwe, the, the, the borders created by Europe. The name was changed, but the borders are the same. All, all these nations in Africa were created because during European colonialism, after the 1884 and 85 conference in Berlin, European nations, during that time, they sat down, they looked at a map of Africa, and they divided up among themselves. Four, uh, 14 nations were represented, but about 12 participated. They just simply said, okay, uh, Britain, uh, you want this mountain, we'll give you that mountain. That's Mount Kenya. German said, but we'll take, Mount, we'll take Kilimanjaro. So you want the Niger River? Okay, but we'll take the Congo. French, we, we'll do this. this. This is how it was done, the whole map. Now, Africans didn't know anything about this. Africans were not participating. There were no Africans in the meeting in Berlin between November and February when they did this in the winter of uh, 84 and 85. They just sat down and said, okay, we are the major powers in the world and, le and let's look at the African map and let us decide, as one of them said, King Leopold, how to divide this magnificent cake. That's what they saw in Africa. It was a cake. You just cut it up like a pie. You, well, pie, you're more evenly like a cake. Big pieces, small pieces, crumbs. You know, you can have any piece you want. This is the way they did it. And when they did that, then they went to Africa and they imposed those kinds of principles on the African continent. And that's why we have the states. This is probably why we have a lot of the conflicts and struggles that we have on the African continent now. So what, what Sheikh Anta Jope, the Senegalese scholar, was, was thinking of was, wait a minute. Let us then rethink Africa according to African ideals. Let us reconfigure Africa on the basis of our own cultural unity. There are certain things that we all agree. There are certain things that are different, certainly. We have different histories. We're not the same. We have different ancestors and, and, and we create different ethnic groups. But Overall, there are certain commonalities that exist among African people that we can agree on. Let's agree on those. But of course, 1948 uh, came three years after the 1945 Manchester Conference in England. And the Manchester Conference on Pan-Africanism was a very broad conference. It brought together many of the people who would eventually be leaders of African countries. Uh, these people, like uh, Kenyatta and uh, Kwame Nkrumah, 
uh, were uh, Kenyatta was for Kenya, of course, and uh, Kwame Nkrumah for, for Ghana, uh, came together, sat down with people like W.B. Du Bois from the U.S., um, with uh, George Padmore, and with other uh, intellectuals and scholars, and they were trying to make an approach to the European world about what should happen to Africa, that Africa should be for Africans. Now, this was going on at the moment just after the death of Marcus Garvey, who had argued in the early part of the 20th century that Africa should be for Africans at home and abroad, that he saw, and he said this in his own statement, the United States of Africa. That he was the first one to say, use these expressions, the United States of Africa. What, what we have, where we are now is that in 2007, there was a conference in Accra, Ghana. At this conference in Accra, Ghana, 2007, there was an agreement on the part of the heads of states, heads of state at that time, that there should be a United State of Africa, United States of Africa by 2017. I don't think we're going to make that date. I will tell you what the problems are, and I will show you how this uh, is uh, interwoven into the intellectual, theoretical, uh, uh, and ideological question of Afrocentricity uh, and negritude as well. Here's the deal. Africa is a huge continent. It's the second largest continent in the world. You can put the 48 states of the U.S., of America, inside Africa four times. You can, in fact, drop the 48 states into the Sahara Desert in Africa. That's how big the Sahara is. You, that the Sahara is as big as the 48 states. So you can just drop all 48 states. It's a huge continent. It's a massive, massive uh, continent. Uh, I will never forget uh, once I, I flew from, from Johannesburg to uh, Washington. And, it, it, and, and if you fly from Johannesburg to Washington, most of your travel is not over the ocean, is not in America. Most of your travel is over Africa. You fly nine hours from, uh, from Johannesburg to Dakar. That's a nine hour flight. And, you, and you're still in Africa. And you haven't even got to the ocean yet. <laughs> then, then you fly across the ocean to Washington, which is about seven hours. So, so most of your time, when you're flying, if you go to Cape Town, it's even farther, you see? It's a huge continent, a massive continent. So this massive continent, if it were one nation, would be the third largest nation in the world in terms of population. After China and India, you would have one billion people in Africa. It would be a third largest country. Not only would it be a third largest country, it would be the world's wealthiest country in terms of natural resources. The natural resources of Africa would constitute the richest uh, base of natural resources in the world in terms of all of the minerals and all of the, uh, uh, the timber, uh, all of the uh, hydroelectric possibilities, it would be the richest country in the world, Africa. At this stage, Africa has 14 nations that are landlocked. That is, they have no outlet to the sea. If you had one nation, you would have one nation with one of the largest seacoasts in the world. And you would have extraordinary ability in terms of fishing, you see, and resources in the sea. You would also have an incredible uh, nation of, um, uh, with, with oil production, because, because of the offshore oil, oil that is now uh, found uh, in, on land as well as off land in Angola and Nigeria area in Gabon, massive deposits of uranium in Chad, in Niger, in Namibia, incredible amounts of titanium, and all of the things that we use for 
modern technology in the Congo. That's, that's how massive it would be, right? So why hasn't it happened? Well, what is the problem here? Well, let me just tell you, give you some history. In 2002, there was a recreation in Africa of something, well, well there, was a, there was the end of something and the creation of something. There was the end of the Organization of African Unity, an organization that had been created in the early 1960s, I think 1963, had been created in the 60s, led by Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Nasser of Egypt, and Haile Selassie of Ethiopia at the time. And, and their idea was to have an organization of African unity for two purposes. The first purpose of this organization would be to rid the continent of Africa of white colonial uh, influence, to, to make sure that every country is free and independent. That was the first task. The second task, according to their charter, was to make sure that they move toward the unity of the African continent. They succeeded on the first task. They were able to completely eliminate um, uh, colonial rule in Africa. With the end of uh, apartheid in South Africa, they, the continent was free. They had, had set up committees for this. They supported the resistance movements and the guerrilla uh, armies. They, they did a great job on that, but they did not move toward unity. And so, in 2002, they decided that what they had to do was to abandon the OAU because the OAU did not have enough power in its charter to basically pressure the nations to come together. So they abandoned it and they created an organization that's called today the African Union. The African Union has one mission and that mission is to bring about the United States of Africa. That's his only mission. Now, of course, there are always obstacles and there are always detractors. And there have always been people since it was created in 2002 who attempted to divert it from its, its original intention. And, and you still have these people on the continent of Africa. Uh, I worked with the African Union uh, uh, and um, Actually, there is a conference coming up next month in Lome, Togo, on the same question. So this question is, a, it, it's, and I've been invited to come and talk about, you know, what kind of system should we have? Should we have a federal system? You know, is federalism a possibility and that kind of thing? But, but here's what the deal is. The problems are solvable. One problem, people say language. Africa has more languages than any other continent on the face of the earth. More languages are spoken in Africa. Over 2,000 languages are spoken on the continent. So what language will we choose? That's a big issue, right? But that issue, fortunately, has been resolved. They've selected four languages. Four languages have already been selected. French, English, um, uh, Kiswahili, and Arabic. Those are four languages that have already been chosen. So that part is resolved. The other part is, if you travel in Africa today, if you go from one country to another, you most likely will have to have a visa. So uh, I ran into that problem myself, trying to go from Senegal to Cote d'Ivoire. Big problem. Try to go from, um, if you want to go from, from France to Cote d'Ivoire, you don't need a visa. If you want to go from England to Nigeria, you don't need a visa. But try to go to Nigeria from Congo, you need a visa. <laughs> so, so I had to wipe away this, this idea of visas. And not only, and this is moving now uh, on the continent, uh, because ultimately there should be one passport. The passport will say Africa. And if the passport says Africa, it means you can travel anywhere on the continent. You, you don't have to, I mean, it's just like when people go to Europe, if you go to Europe and you land in Spain, you can go to any other country you want to. 
You just, you, you're free because basically the European Union has made it possible you can travel from Spain to Sweden, no problem. Because you've been, you've, been, you've been admitted into Spain, so you can go anywhere you want to. In Africa, that is not yet the case. That has to be the case. And if people live on the continent, they ought to be able to travel freely over the continent. That's, a, that's an issue that is, still need to be resolved. But here's another problem. The problem now is that there are so many bilateral agreements between African nations and European nations and America and China. They all rush to make these bilateral agreements, I believe, with African nations once they heard that Africa was thinking of becoming one nation. So what does that mean? That means, okay, if the U.S. has an agreement with Nigeria for oil, what does it mean if you have a United States of Africa and you have one country? And Nigeria is just one government in that country, one state in that country. Is that, do, do you have to break this agreement with Nigeria and the United States and renegotiate a, uh, an agreement with the United States of Africa, with another nation? So, so the United States, China, Britain, France, many other nations quickly move to basically tie up the African nations in bilateral agreements. China, for example, went to Zimbabwe and said, okay, we'll give you $9 billion for your rail railroads and your highways if you grant to us a, a, a long-term long lease to look for minerals in your country. So what do you do when Zimbabwe now is not a country, it's just a state? And the country is the United States of Africa with a central government. What, what happens to that, that, that agreement that Zimbabwe has made with China or that Congo has made with China or Guinea has made with China? These are countries that made the $9 billion agreement with China. So China made $9 billion agreement with about eight African nations, you see? So we give you $9 billion. And this is amazing because you remember, the United States has never given the whole continent of Africa, outside of Egypt, has never given the whole continent of Africa $9 billion. But China goes from country to country making deals for $9 billion. My wife and I were in Congo. Kinshasa, D DRC, and the DRC, they announced in the newspaper, China, uh, make a deal, $9 billion, right? So, and $9 billion is visible. Um, uh, this is just for background information. American aid is not visible in Africa. You can't see it. $9 billion, you see highways, stadia, stadia uh, you see railroad stations, you, you see buildings. American aid really is it, a different kind of aid, and it's a different kind of philosophy. In fact, most people argue that America's aid is really aid for American workers. In other words, America says to um, uh, uh, Senegal, we, we'll give you $500 million, but, but, but the $500 million you would have to spend it in the U.S. We will give you $500 million, but $100 million will be for consultants from the U.S. We'll give you $500 million, but you got to buy everything from Caterpillar. Caterpillar. You see? So it's a whole, it's a different relationship. And it, but these all, all these nations do the same thing. I mean, different relationship. The Chinese, they give you $9 billion, and then they bring the Chinese in your country to build it. And they build their own village, own community. They bring everything. You see? This is a different r way of looking at this. But for Africa, the complication grew deeper over the last 10 years. Here's why. In 2007, I told you at the Accra conference of the heads of state, they decided there, there were two groups of people, two groups of presidents 
and prime ministers. One group was for fast track. The other group wanted slow track. The fast track people were saying, let's bring the United States of Africa into existence tomorrow. In fact, at that time, I was friends with a um, president. Uh, we fell out, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, President Wad, Abdullah Wad of Senegal, right? Pre President Wad, who used to call me his son, right? He's, a, he's, he's 90 years old almost. He's a really <laughs> interesting man. The first, first time I ever flew on a presidential plane, I flew on uh, Abdullah Wad's plane, right? So Wad uh, used to make a statement which was very profound. If we could, and he would say this, to the, to the meetings of African presidents. If we could bring about the United States of Africa, I would gladly become a governor of Senegal tomorrow. That's what's, and that, it just ring, was just a powerful statement. Can you imagine president of South Africa or, or, or Sudan? If, if we could have the United States of Africa, I would happily be a governor of Sudan, I would happily be the governor of Zimbabwe rather than the president. But egos are something that's amazing, you see? Um, and with Wad, of course, Wad's, Wad's problem ultimately was that Wad really wanted to put his son into office, and that's where we fell out. But he, he really wanted to have a, a dynasty uh, of, of his own children, and, and that, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat when it comes to that kind of stuff. I, I, can't, I can't support a president like that because then you talk about dictatorship again, you see. But his idea, his original idea was good. But there's another factor here, Colonel Gaddafi. Colonel Gaddafi was the leading intellectual behind the United States of Africa movement for the last 10 years. That's, that shows you what some of the problems are going to be. I'm going to show you. It was Gaddafi who moved the OAU intellectually to the African Union. And this, was, this happened in Libya, in Sirte. Gaddafi defined himself as an African. This was his idea. Somehow he, he believed in his uh, relationship as a, as a Berber, that he was not necessarily an Arab, but he was a Berber, and the Arabs, if they were going to be in Africa, they had to become Africans. That was his, his understanding. This is what he preached. This is what he taught. Now, in 2007, at a conference in Conakry, Guinea, he announced that he was going to try to force the AU to move toward the United States of Africa. In 2009, in Addis Ababa, at the meeting of the, of the African Union, he declared that we have to do this quickly. But the, as I said, but there were those people who were gradualists. They said, we can't do this. We, in fact, one of the gradualists is a, is a friend of mine, Tabo Mbeki was president of uh, South Africa. I was at a meeting in Abuja in, Niger in uh, Nigeria in 2005, in, uh, in which the, we, we, had, we had a group of uh, presidents as a subcommittee of the African Union and a group of scholars, about 25 of us, talking about how to bring this into existence. And Tabo Mbeki, and at that time, um, uh, Melis Zanawi, president of Ethiopia, were two presidents who were against it. Said, no, we got to move slow. Now, Zanawi is dead, and Becky is out of office. And those are the, were the slow movers. And Becky said, South Africa doesn't, I can't go back to my people and tell them that they should be a part of some grand United States of Africa when they have just come out of fighting apartheid. What will this mean for the, the South Africans who wouldn't understand this and so forth and so on. We didn't realize at the time that he was talking about the xenophobia 
that exists within South Africa. But that's what he was saying. Yeah, I think there was another part to it, the economic part, but that's another issue. Then, of course, uh, Zanawi from Ethiopia was saying, Ethiopia is an ancient country. We have our own identity. We've existed for thousands of years. How could we become a part of the United States of Africa and just be a state in the, con in the, con in the Continental Union of Africa? He says, I can't tell my people that. And then, of course, you had all the other people, even Nigeria, pushing. We can do this. We have to do this. And, of course, you had all the intellectuals. We all believe uh, that you should do it. And one day I'll publish the paper that I gave to these presidents. Uh, but but it, was, it was an important meeting. But, but back to Gaddafi. Part of what I think sealed Gaddafi's fate was that Gaddafi then challenged the West on three levels. The first level is he challenged AFRICOM. How many of you know what AFRICOM is? It's good. It's about like Temple. <laughs> Wherever I ask that question, people never know AFRICOM. AFRICOM is the United States African Command. The United States of America has an African Command. Military Command. And the African Command, the AFRICOM, its aim in Africa is to secure America's interest. It's a, it's a force of about 7,000 troops. In fact, they're even operating in Africa right now, in Chad, they're operating in Mali, they're operating in Uganda. This is American. This is all undercover. It's all under Obama. Yes, progressive Obama. <laughs> I voted for him, but that, that's what's going on. This is all, all under Obama. It would have been worse under Romney in my judgment. But under Obama, this is what's going on, right? You have these American troops in Africa undercover in many different places, all right? You look it up. Look up, look up AFRICOM and look up the operations of these uh, teams, specialized teams of 50 or 100 or 20 or sometimes 12 people operating in Africa, under the cover, all right? Now, AFRICOM was opposed by Libya. Gaddafi came out. He said, we do not need American troops on African soil. And he, and he criticized all the African nations that took AFRICOM bases and said, we could have AFRICOM here. He criticized them. He said, yeah, I can't do that. That was, his, that was one thing he did. Second thing he did was that the African nations did not have their own satellite. You know, to have telephone and all the communication we had, got to have a satellite. The African nations under African Union were paying Europe $500 million a year to use Europe's satellite. So Gaddafi said, you know what? Libya is a rich country. We have more money in Libya than we can use. We only have two million people in the country, but we got all this oil wealth. I will pay three-fourths of the money to buy Africa's own satellite. The rest of the nations can pile in. And, they, and, and so they bought their own satellite. Cut out Europe, getting the $500 million. That was Gaddafi. Then Gaddafi said something else. He says, we need to have our own development bank. And our own development bank should be based on African economic principles. And we do not even need to use the dollar as a base. Let's use gold since Africa produces so much gold. So many people think that that sealed his fate with the West, that he had to go, as far as the Western nations were concerned, that, that there was a possibility that uh, Gaddafi was looming too large in the picture of the African continent. And at every African meeting, wherever you saw Gaddafi, he always wore African clothes. And this was very challenging to other African presidents who wore Western clothes. 
It was a very, he, it was a pronounced statement that he was making. And when I heard him speak in 2004 in Dakar, one of the things that he said was that Africa had never interrogated its own history and culture. To the extent that we use African resources, that we would rather get our sugar from somewhere in Europe than to get sugar from another African country right next door. I mean, so he was raising all kinds of questions that were troubling, and troubling in an economic sense that would create problems. This was an issue. Now, here's the future. The future is this. The United States of Africa, I think, will happen. But there's one big problem that it has to get through. It's the problem of the North, the Northern countries, with strong Islamic base, and the uh, rest of the nations in Africa. That's a big problem. Under Gaddafi, we could see the end of that, because Gaddafi was for African nationalism. There is no leader in any of the northern countries, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, no leader of any of those countries that I can see over the last couple of years that I could consider an African nationalist. It was only Libya. Algeria, to a certain extent, carried by Libya at one time, but only Libya that took a strong African position. And, and, and because of that, there are many other nations, like South Africa particularly, that look very, um, they, they, they're very concerned about uh, you know, bringing in these five countries in the north into a United States of Africa. What will that mean for the future of the African continent? Some people say we should just simply have a black African um, United States of Africa. Just, just only the black nations that claim that African identity. Other people said no, uh, Marcus Garvey and Nkrumah, particularly Nkrumah, they wanted the entire continent to be one. And so that's a big, that's a hurdle that I have not, I have not seen an answer to that hurdle yet. I mean, I think that at Lo, at, in Lome and Togo, we will be discussing some ways to, to sort of challenge this idea that you can have a United States of Africa that would bring in all of these nations. Some people raise the issues of uh, ethnicity, but we always say that ethnicity is not a major problem when you look at, for example, India. India has many ethnicities. China has many ethnicities, even though, of course, in China, the Han are the largest ethnicity. But there are many ethnicities in these countries, and yet they have their united nations, you see? And since Africa gave the world the first United Nation, which was Egypt, in one of my books, I, I, what I did was to do a, uh, I, do a I did a, uh, actually an annotation of the first Greek author writing about Egypt, who was Herodotus, do an annotation of his work, because it's extremely important what he said and what he wrote about Egypt. He understood it clearly, and the relationship of Egypt to Greece, and the blackness of the Egyptians. This is the Greek, the Greek writer writes about that in here, you see? So part of this whole question of Egypt was that the first, the, the, what, when it was developed, and why it was called the world's first nation, is because the king, Menes, from the south of Egypt, went along the Nile River, and he conquered one ethnic group after another until he conquered 42 ethnic groups. And he, he molded them into one nation. That never happened before. Before people were, you had kingships, you see? People were king of their own particular group. You had clans and so on. He, he molded these people into one nation where you had a paramount king and then you had different, uh, different provinces. So I guess in the end, the way uh, negritude operates is that ne uh, negritude itself was not merely a revolt, but as I said to you at the beginning, it was a return, it was also pointing us to our past. In the Ghanaian expression, sankofa, sankofa, return and fetch it, return to the past, 
find the source, return to the source. That's what the revolt did for Africans during the Negritude movement. Afrocentricity simply became the engine and is now, I believe, the principal uh, driving force, philosophical driving force for Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is an empty shell without the substance of African agency. And Afrocentricity provides African agency. That is, a, is, is the source of all of this. So I want to say thank you very much, and I appreciate you uh, for listening. And I will take any questions. I think we have time for questions. Thank you. Some questions, and I know Dr. Uh, Coma's class. I think you all get out at four, five, fifteen. So I do not want to um, make you feel like you are going to be kept captive. Um, but we do want to um, get some some questions, and we have at least about fifteen minutes. Yes. Yes, sir. Professor Santa, I'm wondering about the way you identified Muhammad Gaddafi. Yes. Um, uh, as at least somewhere that demonstrated itself to be a leader uh, in terms of trying to advance the idea of the United States of Africa. And, and, and that is indeed, you know, he has quite a clear track record of doing that, for getting that for the longest time. But how do you marry that? I know his past, you know, but how do you marry that nationalist drive on his part with? At least, what was also established as his very dictator, you know, his dictatorship, in, you know, uh, in Libya. You know, do you see any kind of contradiction? Well, I think, yes. Okay, I'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, I thought you were going to ask uh, my friend. I have a friend uh, in Nigeria, Chinwezu. I don't know whether you know Chinwezu. He's a very good friend of mine, and he and I have gone back and forth on Gaddafi. But, uh, uh, but it's not about the dictatorship that he's, he's raised questions. He's raised questions about what he considers to be uh, the, the Arab expansionism. But that's another question. But in terms of the dictatorship, um, uh, I've only been to Libya once. And uh, I don't know, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I am not, I wasn't close. I can't say I was close to Gaddafi. Uh, my wife and I saw him uh, once in, uh, twice. I saw him twice. We saw him once in uh, Dakar uh, at uh, the inauguration of President Watt. Now, here's the thing with uh, Gaddafi, is that Gaddafi um, had created in Libya, and most people in America don't know this, he had created in Libya basically uh, the most advanced state in Africa. Uh, you're right, he served, what, 40, 40 years or something, 42 years, something. But, but if you look at the Libyan people, you have to look at where, where they were when he, be, when he became uh, leader of Libya. I mean, uh, it was a backwards uh, country. Uh, it, it was basically, had been a long time a, a colony of Italy and the U.S. And uh, the people had uh, very limited education. Uh, but by the time he was killed, Libya uh, had free housing for people. You can, oh, everybody had free housing. You had free education in the university, up to the university system. You had free health care in Libya. Uh, people in Libya had jobs. They had so many jobs in Libya that they had to import people to work in Libya. And that's why so much chaos happened afterwards because there were people trying to get out of Libya uh, during the war to go back to their own homes and own places. But, um, uh, but in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the dictatorship, it was a dictatorship. Um, he, he, here's what I say about, uh, even though I'm a Democrat, in terms of, uh, with a small d, I, and sometimes I vote with a big D, but no problem. But, but, but here's the thing I say about it, that I learned this in political science class when I was a student. And if you're in political science class, you, you learn this. There are different forms of governance. There's no form of government that's perfect. But perhaps for the masses of people, there is no form of government any better than a benevolent dictatorship. 
That's when a dictator says, okay, people need health care, they got it. People need education, they got it. Now, there's also nothing worse politically than a bad dictatorship. But as far as an efficient government system, if you have a benevolent dictator, you can have a pretty good system. I know Americans don't like to think like that. <laughs> but I, I'm, but, but you, you cut through a whole lot of stuff. You know, you say, and, and of course, what that does, of course, is um, it creates a system like, as I said, like Libya, where you had the best roads in Africa. You had, uh, you had, you had, you know, everything was, was good. I mean, except that, of course, the dictator was corrupt. I mean, that's a problem. Yes. Um, you said that you think one day there will be the United States of Africa. Yes. You think it will happen. Um, maybe not as soon as some people would like it to. Right. But then you also mentioned about the bilateral agreements with America, China, and other countries. Um, how do you see that settled? Um, they they, they will be they will be broken and renegotiated, and 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 uh, they will create a lot of friction with the outside because countries. I, could, I, could, yeah. I would imagine that China and, and America and, right. and some of those powerful countries not right. pushing hard not to break them because of the rich resources that exist in Africa. Absolutely. And wanting to have that power and control. A absolutely. Absolutely. But you know what they are doing, and this is the problem with the way it is now, is that, um, the, uh, let's take China rather than the U.S., if China goes to Africa, there are, there are 55 nations, right? It goes to uh, a, um, Gabon, which is an oil producer. And by the way, Gabon, you may not know this, is like in per capita income, is probably the fifth richest country in the world. That's in Africa, Gabon. They go to Gabon and they say, we want to make a deal with you for your oil. And this is the deal we want to make. And Gabon says, no, we're not going to make that deal. So now what they do, go next, they go to Angola. They say, okay, we, we offered a deal to um, Gabon. Gabon did not take the deal, so will you do this deal? So Angola takes the deal. So they have pitted one African nation against another African nation. When you have one government, one government, all the deals are the same for all 55 of the, of the states. You, you, you won't have this problem that we now have of each country trying to outdo the other one for the benefit of getting gifts from Europe or the U.S. or from China. So this is, a, this is the, it's an amazing problem. And it cannot be resolved until we have a United States of Africa where you have one foreign policy. One foreign policy, not 55 foreign policies, one foreign policy on the part of the African continent continental state, just like the United States. And in fact, one of the things they always say at these meetings of the AU is we need to take the African presidents and travel to different states in the U.S. so they can see how it works. They have no conception that it can work, that Texas could be in the same. In fact, there's an, interest, <laughs> there's an interesting thing. You may have saw that Texas is trying to secede. <laughs> some, people, some people said Texas. In fact, some person said, why should Texas be in the same union with Vermont? They said, well, wait, what is this? This is, this is, they, they, can't, they can't understand it. And the Texans can't understand it. You know, the people of Vermont, they don't have Vermont. But the people in Texas, they have this problem. You know, they said, we, we want to we be by ourselves. And, but there are places in the U.S., when you start looking at it, that, there, there, there are a great variety of nation. I mean, of, uh, of, uh, of attitudes in this country. I mean, the state of Washington, you know, the state of Washington is in the same union with Mississippi? Come on. Washington is the most liberal state in the country. And it's, in the, it's with the most conservative. So, so you, it could work in Africa. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying that all these ideas can work, but you have to have one government, and you have to have one military. If you, you take all the military, 55 nations, if you count up the number of troops, soldiers, that's under arms, that got guns in Africa, 
you will have an army the size of China, over three million people under arms. That's bigger than the United States Army. That's crazy. Why, why do they need all those people? If you have one, it's only because you got these different nations believing that they should have all these troops. But if there's one nation and it's organized militarily, then you, can, you don't have to have as many troops. Yes. See, um, I, maybe I shouldn't phrase it that way. Do you think, or at least I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that's what I should mm -hmm. say, I think that, the, that at the heart of so much of this, I mean, you talk about President Wad being yes. willing to step down as governor, but don't you think he's really an anomaly? That yeah. most of the, that so much of the problem would be the egos of the, yes. and, and, not, and not even just egos, right? Yes. I mean, who just gives up power voluntarily? Yes, right. Who gives up big lavish mansions? <laughs> who gives up servants and, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on, right? But Dr. Lucky, you hit the, <laughs> yes, I mean, that's the problem. That's why it's so difficult. And in fact, in, in fact, to your point, um, that's why I say they in 2007, the people in 2007, they voted. They said, no, let's not do it next year or year after that. Let's do it to, in, in 2017. Well, they're all out of office now. They all did their, <laughs> their thing, you know. The guy who hosted it in Ghana, he's out of office, you see. So, so it's pushing it down the road. But here's what I think. What I think and a lot of other people are working on this, because they're still having meetings. At the level of the so-called foreign ministers, um, what do they call, um, at the level of the foreign ministers in those countries, the, uh, what we call Secretary of State, th what they do, they, uh, they meet, and they're working out all the details, the, uh, the situation with tariffs, the situation with uh, identification. They're doing all kinds of groundwork for this. Uh, before they eventually will present the whole thing to the heads of state. But what I think is that it's the masses of people who will demand it. That's what we're working with now. We have an organization called Afrocentricity International, where we're trying to have uh, chapters in every African nation. Those people will be for United States of Africa. They will push and drive the masses toward bringing this into existence. But there are a lot of movements like this. It's not just Afrocentricity International. A lot of other people at the local level, they're saying part of our political philosophy and our political party is that we believe in the United States of Africa. That's in their, in their, in, in, in their mission. So if that's in the mission of some of the political parties in African nations, then ultimately that will come up from the ground. ground and, uh, uh, but, but you're right, ego is the biggest problem. It is our biggest problem. Will you all join me in thanking Dr. Sanders?